Okay, in this next example, we are going to uh, illustrate the application of the direct stiffness method to truss analysis with a little bit more complicated arrangement of members. It'll help el illustrate what we do with big scale trusses. This is just assemblage of three different members. It still is statically indeterminate, so that, that uh, right away means that we'd like to do something uh, more than just a really simple uh, approach. We got three members that have the same E and the same A, but they have different lengths. We only have one uh, applied force here. What we're going to do in this video is just set everything up and then we're going to apply two different approaches to assembling the uh, big structural stiffness matrix. One of them is going to be the general stiffness method and then we'll come back with a second uh, series and talk about the direct stiffness approach. That direct stiffness approach is going to require us to have to deal with inclined members and members, in other words, that are not aligned with the global coordinate system. So let's get all of that uh, from a big picture established. Right, remember in our methodology, or really our semantics here, uppercase means the global coordinate system and lowercase means something about the member only. Right, so I'm going to come along and, and start making some modeling decisions here. I see since that we have a pin connected truss that I've got the possibility of displacements that I care about in two directions, an X and a Y at each and every member end. Since there's a total of four unique uh, locations where members are connected, that means four times two, I have a total of eight complete degrees of freedom two of which are established right up here at that top joint that is free to move in two, both directions. Whereas I come down to the lower left, that's a support. So I'm just going to label my degrees of freedom, already thinking about how I would partition this up and make it easy to manipulate all of the equations later on. Now, it's probably best if we use the right-hand coordinate system for all the global degrees of freedom. You really don't want to uh, change those around. Um, you can, but it's not particularly a, a wise thing to do when you're processing things by hand at all. Right? So note, again, we've got um, a total then of eight degrees of freedom in the system. And then let's get some labels in here for other things, such as We've got three members. There's member one, member two, and member three. The EA over L of each member, the axial stiffness of that each member will become prominent. And so note here that K1 will turn out to be E times A over L1. Well, let's look at these heights. We've got a four foot high member in the middle. And with the 45 degree that we have on the left member, that would be four root two. And then the right hand member is at a three, four, five inclination, three on the bottom, four high. So it is five foot long for that one. All right, so the longest member is the one on the left. With everything else being the same, it should therefore be the most flexible. And that's what we see. It has the smallest stiffness, 320.4 kips per inch for that one. Axial stiffness of the middle member at 453.1 kips per inch. And axial stiffness of the right member then at 362. Uh, 0.5 kips per inch. We're interested ultimately in understanding how this member responds, finding the member forces and reactions to this 5 kip load that's applied to the left. Right now, as we're going to go further on to this in the setup of, of, of coming up with these stiffness coefficients and all the terms that go into the nodal displacement vector and the uh, nodal force vector, we need to take what we have here and translate it over into a model that thinks in the global coordinate system of all the forces that might be at the joints. Right now we want to use the exact same set that we have over here in terms of the directions assigning positive. We don't want to be mixing and mass, maxing these. So you're not trying to intuit what these responses are going to be. So if these are the forces, there's your Q1, there's your Q2, there's Q3, there's Q4, and then so on and so forth, just like we have laid out the kinematic degrees of freedom. But note that these are now in the positive direction. So when we would go to look at 
could say this force vector here, kd equal q, or we can represent it up here as well. This q vector then is going to be a 8 by 1, 8 entries. Q1 would be equal to minus 5. Q2 has no force applied, so that's 0. Now the rest of these are all support forces. So since I segregated those out, I'm going to just put that little line there. Q3, Q4, so on and so forth, down to Q8. I don't know what those are. Those are going to be a result of the response of the system. Really what they are, the forces necessary so that the displacements in all directions at those bottom joints or nodes is equal to zero. So if we come back over to what we've got here and now also label our displacements, I don't know what D2 and D1 are. Those are unknown. But D3 will be equal to zero. D4 is equal to zero. D5 is equal to zero. D6 equals zero. So on and so forth. D7 equals zero. D8 equals zero. So in that displacement vector, that we would have, that would look something like so. Don't know D1 and D2, those are unknown. Again, I partition this out by my node numbering. It's easy to see what this is going to be like. And the rest of these are all just zeros all the way down. And again, this is the size of that's 8 by 1, and that's also 8 by 1. Right, that's the general setup. Now, next, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the process of how we create that structural stiffness matrix, first using the generalized stiffness method, and then we'll do it again using the uh, direct stiffness method.